The bombing campaign to drive Saddam Hussein from Kuwait began early on the 17th of January. In Baghdad, it was witnessed by the world's media. We saw a lot of bombing. Uh, it was quite heavy, in fact, in the first five, five days I think I was there. And uh, it was extraordinarily accurate bombing. Uh, they took out things like the communications tower very, very neatly. There was another big building belonging to the Ministry of Defense, which was completely destroyed by a single missile landing and, and hitting it in the center and, and going traveling down to the basement and destroying that building. 15 February, after a month of bombardment of Iraq's war-making capacity, Yevgeny Primakov, President Gorbachev's special envoy, views the ruins. There is little civilian damage to be seen. If, if one wages the war, he hits the civilian districts as well. And uh, from this point of view also, the war is tremendous. Terrible. Terrible. The coalition, from the start, has been fighting to uphold the principles of the United Nations. And under those circumstances, the last thing we were going to do was either to seek to destroy the Iraqi civilian economic infrastructure or to kill innocent Iraqi civilians. It seemed to me quite an interesting war to cover in that sense, in that for the first time, I think probably in the 20th century, the civilian population wasn't the major target. Why are we bombing Iraq when, you know, the potential battle is in Kuwait? Well, it's a simple fact is that an army has to be fed, it has to be watered, it has to be supplied to fight. Now, if you take away those supplies, so you bomb bridges so the supplies can't reach the, that army, eventually it will wither and die. Similarly, if you cut off the generals from that army, i.e. You, you, you spoil the command and control setup, again, the army can't fight because it has no direction. So those two things, that's why we're seeing the bombing of Iraq for command and control centers, bunkers, and the bridges to so stop the supplies reaching the army. It's as simple as that. Really, the, the infrastructure was very badly hit indeed, and there was no water, there was no electricity over most of Baghdad. I think the infrastructure was, was gone in the first five days. The 20 years since the Vietnam War have seen a total transformation of the technology of aerial warfare. In the Gulf War, each target can be precisely selected and destroyed with clinical accuracy. Yeah, smart weapons were uh, basically developed to achieve maximum military effect because I think the Americans found in Vietnam to knock down one bridge they had to put uh, across dozens and dozens of aircraft, which obviously put the aircraft at risk. Uh, it's expensive in terms of weaponry. So they developed the laser-guided bomb to achieve maximum military effect with, with a small number of weapons. And they were developed for that reason. A fortunate byproduct of that is that you can be particularly accurate. You don't take out civilian uh, buildings, you don't, take, you don't produce any civilian casualties. So that is a thankful byproduct of the smart weapon. What we saw were installations which were largely still standing. And indeed, if you saw them from a little way away, uh, there was no sign that they'd been hit at all. But when you got close, you saw that they'd been disabled by the destruction of really a very small area of the building, of the complex or whatever it was. The phrase economy bombing sprang to mind. When you have a centralized state, such as the kind that, that the Ba'athist party under Saddam built, it is very difficult to separate political control from military control. And therefore a government headquarters becomes a legitimate military target. It is impossible to distinguish between the power plant which is producing solely for the military, and the power plant which is producing for the civilian population. So in that sense, the civilian quality and standard of life is being degraded. The ultimate objective is to remove the ground forces from Kuwait and immediately behind it. But it was never as simple as that, because although there were 500,000 troops which had been moved there progressively from the 2nd of August, they, in turn, were, the de were dependent on the war machine which had been constructed by Saddam Hussein not since August, not even since the end of the Iranian war, but for 20 years. The RAF Buccaneer, a stable platform to guide the bombs in the campaign to cut the vital bridges across the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. 
Well, laser-guided bomb is basically a designated bomb, so you have two aircraft normally take part. And you've seen the old, uh, our old-fashioned Buccaneer there, and I say it has gone out there for use for the first time in anger. The navigator in the Buccaneer uh, puts a cross on the, the target. He finds it on a, if like a TV screen. The navigator who's looking through uh, the television screen in the back seat then takes control uh, of the laser designator pod. The bombs are already airborne. The laser's fired, um, and the bombs will then seek the spot Of course, if you do that, you're normally guaranteed a direct hit. Things do go wrong, however. The coalition has flown over 90,000 missions. Very few bombs have missed their targets and caused civilian casualties. I think that uh, inevitably in a conflict of this type, there will be some civil civilian casualties because we're bombing bridges close to towns. And even though, as I said earlier on, we're trying to minimize the risk to civilians, it is inevitable. I think, however, though, if we'd caused a lot of civilian damage, we'd have seen much more footage from the Iraqis. Although there's been high publicity to individual attacks on, on Baghdad, in fact, the weight of the bombing campaign has concentrated further and further south. Until now, as I say, you have incessant attacks on the Republican Guard and the static defences. The Tornadoes, or the Jaguars, or the Buccaneers, or the F-16s, or the A-10s, or the helicopters, or the Mirage will come in, in waves. And he's now subjected to incessant bombing and has been for three weeks. The final stage has seen the emphasis change from the military infrastructure and communications to the battlefield units and armor occupying or threatening Kuwait. Cluster bomb units, which are small bomblets which can penetrate armor. They'll use cannons, like the A-10 uses its Gatling cannon to good effect. I mean, it actually literally unzips tanks. It's a very potent machine. And they will use normal 1,000-pound bombs. and use laser-guided bombs, um, CRV-7 rockets, which are Canadian high-velocity rockets. To hit a target is my job. If I don't hit a target, I may as well stay back here in the crew room. So when I hit, um, in lots of ways, it makes that sortie of worthwhile. The world's media has little chance to see the reality of the Gulf War, a war being fought out over sea and desert, many miles from civilian population centers. I talk to some of my colleagues out there, and they, they take no comfort in, you know, in civilian casualties. They hate that loss of life, and their family men themselves, they understand that. And of course, they're trying their best to reduce that. It is regrettable, as you point out, but we are at war, and they're trying to do a military job out there, and they're saddened by it, but it doesn't reduce their resolve. People, I've got no bitch about the people in Iraq. There's one guy who's the problem at the moment. We can't get at him. I wish we could. The coalition's bombing campaign is to drive Saddam Hussein from Kuwait, not to punish the people of Iraq.